Well, I'm back as promised. Today's video may be the most important, the most relevant video I've done in these past three years. I've got Just as you can find a new adventure and a new love after your first marriage, so can you find a new life in a foreign land. For me, for now, it's South America. My name is Lauren Lau, and this is my adventure in Grand Colombia. I've got around 360 videos. This may be the most important video you will watch. So I have a question for you. Why is it, or have you even noticed, that many gringos want to go live in a place where there's no other gringos? Why is it that many Americans or Canadians want to go somewhere where there is no one else from where they're from? We're very few. Why is that? Have you asked yourself that? Have you noticed how many people claim that they want to go live in the culture? They want to assimilate, they want to be part of the culture, they don't want to be viewed as something other than that. Now, I'm not one of those. I absorb what I want. I remain true to who I want to be. I live the way I choose to live. Some of it was Ecuadorian, some of it was Colombian, but I'm always going to be from the United States. That's where I was born and brought up. I'm not ashamed of that. I don't feel the need to convince other people that I'm something that I'm not. But you need to ask yourself these questions. Why is it important? It's important because we need to discuss the economy and where problems come from. And I hate to say it, but many of you bring the problems. Now, why is that? Am I blaming you? No, it's a lack of education. I'm here to give you that information so you can review your approach to this whole thing about being a tourist or being an expat, moving, an immigrant, whatever you want to call it, however long you plan to spend in Ecuador or in Colombia. And this applies to both countries. So what is it that happens? What, where does the problem come in? People come into the culture coming from a place where they're earning twenty, thirty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars a year. They're coming from that economy. And they step into, in Colombia's case, many go to Medellin. Very often it's El Poblado, one of the most expensive places in Colombia. And they go there and they see that they can live really well on the kind of money that they're earning. Or they can go to Ecuador, they can go to Cuenca, probably the most expensive place in Ecuador. And they can live really well. It is, they look at it and they say, oh my God, it's so cheap. I've got so much more money than I need here. And as a result, they carry with them the propensity for tipping. And they look around and they say, all these poor people, they're just, you know, they're poor. They're just not making the kind of money that I'm making. Here I am living like a fat hog in, in a puddle of mud. And you see people that are scraping by living day to day and some people feel guilty and so they try to compensate for that also some people feel rich and they love that feeling and so they're kind of throwing things around what do you mean throwing things around they're leaving tips where tips aren't appropriate they're overpaying for things without questioning it because oh my god it's just so cheap it doesn't really matter i understand the feelings behind that. I'll tell you a quick story. When I went to the Philippines, I had already traveled all over Asia, around Europe. I've been to many places. But when I got to the Philippines, it was really an eye-opener. I was there for about a month. And even though I had been to some places in Mexico, I had never seen the level of poverty that I saw in the Philippines. And at the time, in those days, the middle class in the Philippines was almost non-existent. You were each, either very, very wealthy or you were very, very poor. And by poor, I mean barely subsistence. And I used to have nightmares about my time in the Philippines. And you say, well, what was the nightmares? 
Well, to tell the story, it won't sound like anything you just have a nightmare over. But I had the nightmares because it had such a profound effect on me. I was there when I was in the military, and I was stationed there for a month. I was in helicopters, and we're supporting some recon rangers, which is the equivalent of Navy SEALs, on some training missions. So I had a lot of time when we weren't flying to kind of go out and explore. And I was in a place called Subic Bay. Now, I saw other areas of the Philippines, but my nightmares came from my time there. There was this bridge that we would cross over to go into the, the city there. And the bridge was over a river. And we called that river Shit River. That was the name for it, because it was kind of like open sewage. And you would have, when you got to that bridge, you would have dozens if not hundreds of little kids and these kids would be grubby they'd be filthy they would be you know clothes like not fitting them or holes in them I mean they're just ragamuffins and you couldn't help but really feel bad for them and the economy there I mean one peso was like all the money in the world and at the time it was seven pesos to the dollar so for pennies you're a rich man these kids would dive off of this bridge into this river of raw sewage to dive down into the water to get pesos that that gringos would throw in the water it was like this thing and people would laugh and look at him and you know I found it horrifying and as you walk across the bridge you'd have all these kids you'd just be mobbed by these kids you know please pesos pesos and your first inclination is it's such a little amount of money and so you put the you know you start giving them out you start giving them out well it doesn't end more kids will come more kids will come are you helping people yeah you can argue that you're helping people but you're also creating something that doesn't come from that culture. You're creating a whole new thing in that culture. And here's what my nightmare was. And I could tell you other stories. Some girl came up and offered herself for a bag of rice. I, I didn't want, I, I wasn't interested in having her, but she seemed so desperate this place had such an impact on me I went and bought a bag of rice it was a 10 pound bag of rice that cost almost nothing and I carried it for her to where she lived where she lived was corrugated steel like in a shanty town dirt floor it was just walls of steel propped up with a with a roof it, if it rained, it was going to rain in there. If a good wind came along, the place would blow away. And inside there was her mother and a child that was probably less than a year. It was just a little baby. And they didn't have any food. I, you know, so this 10-pound bag of rice, you know, was a lifesaver for them. And all I'm picturing is, and you know, there's probably half a million people that live in this area with this circumstance you can't help them you can't help them all and I could get biblical on this you know and Jesus said there'll be poor always pathetically struggling but but you can't help but want to do something when you see that but there's so much about the culture that you just don't understand and here's what my nightmare was my nightmare was I'd find myself walking across this bridge and I'd be handing pesos out to these kids and more kids would come and more kids would come and eventually I would run out of pesos. At that point I would wake up with this cold sweat with a feeling of terror. Now <laughs> it's a strange nightmare but I had that nightmare for months after I left. Such a different experience that I had. Again I've been to Mexico which was pretty poor at the time but I'd never seen anything like this. 
so we're affected when we go to another culture. Vietnam had different effect. Different places I went had, you get different feelings about it, but you're always judging it from where you come from. When you come to Colombia, you don't find that kind of thing. You'll find poverty here. You'll find poverty in New York City. You're going to find poverty everywhere in the world. You can't judge a country or a people based on poverty. But there's a healthy, strong middle class here, and there's a wealthy class. There's, there's layers. You have upward mobility. You can work yourself up to middle class. You can work from middle class up to being rich. It's a capitalist, free enterprise society. There's um, a lack of regulations that restrict people from growing. So that's all a plus, and that allows for these classes and this strata. It's nice if you're poor that you've got a way to find your way out of it. And many people do that. But when you come here, you look at it and you only see the poor. And you only see the poor. Why? Because you're seeing the difference of the scale of economy. Now let me, let me just try to give you a little perspective. If you're from San Francisco, most anywhere you go in the United States is going to seem poor as compared to San Francisco. Because in San Francisco, your wage is very, very high as compared to the rest of the country. One example, just one example here is rent. The average rent in San Francisco is about $3,600 a month. Now where I'm from, upstate New York, as of this month, this year, the average rent is just under $1,200 a month. So you can find places for $800, you can find places for $3,000. We're talking average. $1,200 versus $3,600. It's about a third, right? But the salaries are about a third. Everything is on scale. Does that mean everybody in Rochester, New York is poor? Far from it. Rochester, New York has a very strong middle class, tons of rich people, probably similar to San Francisco. It's a different scale of economy. It doesn't mean that the middle class are living so much different than the middle class in San Francisco. You make less, but things cost less. You have less taxes. There's a lot of things that come into play. When you go to Columbia, you're going to find the same thing. Just because you see rents that are cheaper than what you expected doesn't mean that it's, a, it's poor. It doesn't mean it's a poor country. It doesn't mean you're rich. It doesn't mean that you come here based on what you're making somewhere else and here that would be the equivalent. It's just not the case. People earning wages here earn wages on the scale of the economy. Average rents, as of this month in El Poblado, is about the same as Rochester, New York. Now, I say El Poblado, which is in Medellin, is the most expensive area of Medellin. So if you're in Rochester, New York, and you're paying just under $1,200 a month, you can go to El Poblado and expect pretty much the same. The economies of Rochester, New York, and El Poblado and Medellin are fairly similar. However, if you live in Armenia, like I do, also in Colombia, the average rents here are closer to three to four hundred dollars as compared to twelve hundred dollars in El Poblado. Also you can find places around Medellin like Belen or just other places where you're going to find rents that are half as much. Armenia has a different scale of economy. People earn less here but things cost less here. You go to Medellin you're going to get a higher paycheck but things are going to cost more. What you have is a lot of people that go to the United States so they can earn the higher wages, barely spend what they can so they can send this big money as compared to where they come from back to the family. And it seems like there's a ton of money. You can do more with that money somewhere else. But if you're in the United States and you live in Rochester, New York, you can go to San Francisco, get a job, do the exact same thing earn some money, save, 
go back to Rochester, New York and live like a king. Well, maybe not like a king, but you get my point? It's not a thing about Columbia, but it's viewed that way by people coming here. They view it as people are poor. Now, how does this affect the local economy? How does this affect the culture? The culture in Colombia and in Ecuador, they're similar in this aspect, is tipping, for example, is not a thing. It becomes a thing. Where there's a lot of gringos, it becomes a thing because gringos come, they don't know any better, they feel I've got the money and I'm going to be helping somebody. They do it with a good heart, they throw out tips, soon it becomes the norm. But if you get outside of those areas, it's not the norm. It's not a thing. In Colombia and in Ecuador, it's really kind of an insult. It's because it's not, it's, it's not in their history, it's not in their scope of being. When you tip, they look at it like, why do you think I need this? They look at it like you're looking down on them. They were doing, you know, you drive the taxi and in, in Ecuador, in Cuenca, for example, taxi drivers actually earn pretty good money. They live strong middle class lives. Um, unbeknownst to a lot of gringos there and they think all oh, the poor taxi driver and eh, not really but when they get a tip what used to be there now they expect it what used to be there is why do you think you're better than I am and if you if you think about that if tipping's not a thing then if you're giving somebody money why are you giving them the money it's kind of insulting Colombia it's still like that, but not in Medellin and El Poblado because so many gringos, tens of thousands, are there, keep coming and going, and they come down and they, they see things as being inexpensive as compared to where they're from, and they waste money. So what have they done in areas like El Poblado and Medellin? They have taught the local people there that if you see a gringo, Money has no value to them, and they're willing to waste it. Therefore, if you can get them to waste it in your direction, all the better for you. And it becomes, the gringo is the target. The gringos are the suckers. There's a lack of respect for people like that, of the gringos. Because... Money is actually considered almost on the vulgar side. And when you go to a restaurant, they don't bring you the bill. You could sit there for three days, and they're not going to bring you the bill. You have to go up and just go to pay your bill. Because they don't want to bring you the bill and lower themselves to basically feel like they're begging for the money. In places where there aren't gringos, that's what you see and you just know what you're supposed to do and you go up and you, and you pay that bill. When you get to places where there's so many gringos that come in, they've altered that society. They've altered that culture. Grant, keep in mind, by the same people that said they want to go and assimilate and be part of the culture, but then they pat themselves on the back because they're throwing this money around thinking I'm doing some good. They feel it's kind of like a little self-importance sometimes. You know, sometimes it's well-meaning. You know, sometimes there's a little self-importance involved in it. You, how do I know that? Because you'll go to the Facebook post and you'll find people bragging about how they did this and they did that. And I mean, yeah, it's, kind of, it's kind of a self-importance thing. It's okay if it were appropriate. It's not appropriate, and all you're doing is training people to target you because you don't care about your money after all. But then if you have a gringo that's there, and he's trying to live actually like a Colombian, and he doesn't want to waste money, maybe he's on a limited income. Maybe he's a retiree that's you know got $1,500 a month, and he's got to be careful with his money. And he runs into this buzzsaw, of all these people trying to take him for his money. Not because they're bad people, but because over the course of time, they've been taught to do this. It becomes an enterprise unto itself. Rents are the same way. How did the rents get so high in El Poblado? 
because the gringos came in and they said the rents were $500. And they said, oh great, that's such a great price. They pay it without blinking an eye. I need all these deposits. Oh, no problem, no problem. The owners say, oh, let me try six. Let me try seven. Let me try eight. And the gringos come in and say, oh, no problem, no problem. And then you have gringos involved in real estate that are probably the biggest vultures of all that try to convince you. In Ecuador, you get the exact same thing. The, the worst priced real estate are the ones being represented by gringos for the most part. And so it drives up the rents because you think it's no problem. And so whatever that cost is, it's no problem. That drives up the, the value of those rents. What does that do to the local person who doesn't have 50% wage increases every year. It puts these places out of reach and it's not just rent. There's a number of things that the prices get driven up and places become out of reach. There's certain restaurants that maybe they used to go to they just can't afford to go to anymore. You're not doing anyone a favor by coming and trying to compare the economy to the wages that you're earning from somewhere else. It's not realistic. All you do is throw a wrench into the culture as the way it is. All you're doing is mucking things up. So when you go from a place with a high cost of living like San Francisco and you roll into a place with a low cost of living like Rochester, New York, you get a distortion of reality. It takes time for it to settle in to really understand what costs are. To understand why the economy is the way it is and what's your place in that. Throwing money around, treating it like it has no value, throwing it at people as though they're needy and you're their savior, whether that's the motivation or not, that's the way it can come across. You change that culture. The culture in Medellin when I was there almost 20 years ago, was nothing like it is today. Today it's a cottage industry to go out and fleece gringos. Today it's the norm to overcharge on rents. And so this is why you have gringos, particularly those who have been in other places like in Costa Rica, other places where they have seen this occur, they're trying to go to a place where that's not going on because they don't want to live in that constant price escalation. They don't want to live where the local people treat you like you're an ATM and not like you're a human being. One of the things I love about Armenia is I'm just another person here. No one looks at me like I'm a gringo, therefore you're an easy mark and let's target you. It's not like that at all. In most places outside of gringo, popular gringo areas, that's how it is. That's where Colombia is a beautiful country. El Poblado is beautiful in that all it offers, the amenities are there. It came because all those gringos are there spending the money. Makes sense. But the culture is no longer what it once was. And that can be fine too. I'm not saying that good or bad, it can be whatever it is. It's just that many of us choose not to live in a place like that, dealing with those things. So is there a takeaway from this? When you come, you're going to feel, based on the different scale of economy, you have all the money in the world. But if you're going to be living there, particularly if you're going to be a retiree and you're going to be on a fixed income, don't be fooled by that. Don't let that affect you. Just chill, relax, do things the way you normally would. If there's no, if tipping is not a thing, don't do it. Don't try to make yourself feel good because there's a good chance you're making somebody else feel bad. If you give the tip to a driver, for example, yeah, he's gonna take it. He doesn't wanna insult you back and not take it, but he's gonna have feelings about it. It's cultural. It's just, it's in there. So try to understand that about places, and many places in the world are actually like that. Don't go and gringoize an area. Now, like me, I'm a gringo, and there's many things that 
I don't want to give up. But there's many things that I adopt. There's nothing wrong with that, in my opinion. Be who you are. But that doesn't mean I should force on the local people my lifestyle. I hope this does some good. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. I hope that some of you reflect on your actions and how it affects the local culture and other gringos. I'll see you soon.